Hello, Victor. I've just got it. I've given you permission. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Christina. Hi, Victor. Welcome. Lovely to see you. Welcome to the Oxford Astrologer Q&A. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about draconic astrology. I've been really enjoying your book. Actually, I finished it and I left it in my shed. Otherwise, I'd be holding it up. It's called Chasing the Dragons. And I have to admit, I knew nothing about a draconic. There, you can hold up the book. Excellent. Um, I knew nothing about draconic astrology uh, before I read it. And obviously, I was thinking, you know, do I need to learn another technique? Um, yet another thing, another, another, yet another complication. Um, and actually, it's, a, it's just a little extra sort of add on, isn't it, that works with the astrology you already know really well. Could So Victor, explain, tell us your story. How did you get to drac draconic astrology? Well, it, it is, um, I mean, it's the small matter of soul purpose. It's actually a huge subject. And there are plenty of books on the subject. You know, we all know about the nodal axis, the north node being the destiny point. But with draconic, um, which claims to be, oh, I can hear, a, I can see an unmuted person. Who is that? It's Padmini. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Padmini. Nice to see you. Yes, yeah. welcome. Um, we're very sensitive to noise here. Um, so really it's, a system of finding, it, it, it's rather like opening up a portal. So you're using your birth chart to create another birth chart. It's not an alternative. I love, I've read some things on Facebook where people say, oh, I'm a draconic Libra at last. I prefer it to being a tropical Gemini. And unfortunately that this pick and mix approach to astrology is not really what draconic is about. So really what you're doing is opening a door and it really involves moving the north node to the vernal equinox point and creating a moon based chart, which purports to show the higher expression of the person. So you're not doing an alternative chart, you're creating a specialist chart focused on the moon's themes of memory, reflexes. Um, and also it does bring in the idea possibly of reincarnation. I don't necessarily fully embrace the thought because I don't honestly know. But in my book, I do look at the whole question of what is the soul, um, the various religious and philosophical and psychoanalytic ideas of the soul. But I become, I, I, I sort of remain quite agnostic as to which interpretation of the soul I'm going for. I'm not quite sure that I have an interpretation. I'm just aware that we feel in our hearts, we're drawn to certain things, to the situation, to certain energies, to people. And where do these urgings come from? So Draconic tries to look at the chart of this sort of strange nebulous thing we call the soul. Um, now, in a normal astrological chart, I, you know, my chart is my tropical chart, which is the natal chart that we all know. That is also a reflection of my soul, though. So in what way does this is this different and how is it to, more connected to the moon? Well. The North Node, of course, is a feature of the Moon. Uh, we're talking about where the the Sun, the, the the Moon's pathway intersects with the Sun's pathway. So that's the lunar aspect. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly true that in the process of a draconic analysis, which is by far the most popular of the options I offer on my website, by the way, it's quite interesting, how, especially during lockdown, how it became a very big thing about people re-examining their lives. So you start with the tropical birth chart, which will shed a lot of, of information about purpose, not just about what the midheaven is saying about what, what kind of career you should be doing, but actually a more general question and the nature of what the nodal axis is saying and which signs they happen to be in. And that's an early clue. Also the aspects that are formed. Mm. You then recreate the draconic birth chart and it is a birth chart but it's been reconfigured by moving the North Node to North Degrees Aries. Mm. And then you move everything else by the same number of degrees as between your birth North Node and North Degrees Aries. But you're not moving the planets, you're only moving the degrees and the si as signs. And if that sounds horribly complicated, people, 
it, you just press a button these days. Yeah, I was going to say. Once a time, you would have gone like this. But yeah. now you don't have to worry about that because Solar Fire has the Draconic option, AstroDience has it, and all the various other software programs have yeah. got Draconic. So if you go to astro.com, you can get your Draconic chart like that. Just uh, like that. It's the easiest uh, thing as pi. Less easy, and I know this because a number of uh, quite senior astrologers have consulted me on how you do it, is that um, you start with the trough, we'll go to the conic, but the, the, the culmination, so to speak, is what I call the synastry of self by will, where you actually put the draconic birth chart uh, around the tropical one to see if new aspects are created. Can I stop you there? You can. And say, I think it would be a lot easier if we had an example to look at. Well, that's a great cue, Christina. Um, so we're going to share the screen, if that's OK. And also, I've got a question. Where's the chat? Sorry, I can see there's a question there. Um, where is the dr dr draconic chart function in Solar Fire? I could not find it. That's from Peg. Well, if you look in the Zodiac menu, um, you'll find it. Um, if you scroll down, um, and you'll find it. It's there. Does uh, that answer it? <laughs> um, yeah, no, because I don't use Solar Fire, so I'm just, I'm just, uh, I know it's also- Yes, it's, the, it's a, from memory, it's the Zodiac menu and just scroll down and you'll find Draconic. And so you create your tropical birth chart first, then you uh, just simply uh, go to new, new charts. And then that's this time opt for the Draconic version. So you've already got two birth charts. And then you can create your synastry of self by will. Let's have a look at this one that you're going to do. Well, so um, oh, uh, sorry about the advert, people. Um, oh, that's the transits for today, by the way. Oh, well, let's look at that in a minute because I, I want to talk about once we've had a quick. So essentially, guys, just while Victor's getting the stuff up, we're going to do you know. Um, 25 minutes, 20 minutes on Draconic, just so that we all get a little taste of it, and then probably talk about the uh, astrology for today and some, okay. some other astrology for this summer. Carry on, crack on. Now, crack on, Vic. Um, so I'm going to give you like a super fast um, three-step process, and I've looked at the Queen's chart, basically because we all know who she is. And um, I'm sure we're all familiar. Incidentally, I was saying to Christina before we went live, well, tomorrow, this is a pure coincidence, the draconic sun enters Taurus and will be conjunct the queen's tropical sun. So this, this is actually quite momentous. And we'll come back to that. So we're looking at all sorts of different things in the tropical chart. Um, I look at modalities and elements, for example. So this is a very fixed chart. It's a bucket chart, which puts Saturn as the handle. That's very relevant. Let's imagine that this, we don't know whose chart this belongs to. We would immediately assume that Saturn plays a very important part in the life as an authority, as a, an exemplar of, of various heavy obligations and responsibilities. In Scorpio, perhaps it's less clear, but the fact that it's a handle planet tells you something about the life purpose. Christina said earlier, the tropical chart already tells us a lot about soul purpose. Well. The position of Saturn as a handle to the bucket, and you've got the boundary planets, Mars, Neptune opposite each other, that's quite interesting too, with uh, Neptune in Leo, which I think is actually very uh, representative of the kind of role she plays. It's a sort of strange, shapeless thing, and yet it's in regal Leo. Um, and of course, the sun is in the fourth in Taurus, as we see. Now, this is speeded up. Normally, you know, I'd be like 3,000 words in, so I'm only giving you a very, very basic assessment of this chart. The North Node is in Cancer. Now, I talked about the nodal axis. So what we deduce from the nodal position of Cancer is that part of the destiny has to do with family. But we're not just talking about family. We could be talking about the country, the nation. And that's uh, emphasized by the fact that the sun is in the fourth house. Um, and uh, it's next to Pluto, which uh, it, it, admittedly that's pretty wide, but nonetheless is indicative of heavy responsibility. It's quite profound. Now, when we move to the Queen's draconic chart, we notice that whereas we had Capricorn rising, we now have Libra rising, which is interesting, but the sun 
is moved into Capricorn, which I think tells me is more um, reflective of her actual role as being head of the constitution, albeit symbolically, it's neither here nor there. So Saturn um, is now in regal Leo. And again, I've, ta I've taken her chart, it's actually very straightforward. But I would always say that if, if this were a draconic assessment, I would say that she is born to be in the spotlight, carrying a very heavy responsibility. It is actually part of her chart, but with, Ven with uh, Libra rising, there's also the need to bring people together. There is a unifying theme in this life. Just as if you look at Queen Victoria's chart, um, when you look at her draconic chart, she's got Taurus rising, which is highly representative of stability, of uh, prosperity of, the, of, the, of that age, albeit based on empire. And, um, but in this particular chart, Venus rules, but in a different expression of trying to bring peoples together and of uh, negotiating a much trickier time, I think. Um, and we see also that Pluto slips into Pisces, still close to the North Node in Aries, but this time Pisces is a more, I'm not gonna use that awful word nebulous again, but it's certainly a sign of unity. It's another unifying theme here. So, um, so could I just interrupt yeah. and, and say, well, just basically what's happened is that you've kept, everything is in the same relationship to each other. All yes, the same aspects. Are same in the aspects. same relationship. What you've moved the nodes to zero degrees Aries yeah. and kept by keeping everything in the same relationship, um, you, everything changes, everything else changes signs also. So it's the same houses, but it's different signs. And that's quite, it. that's the essence of it, I suppose. That is the essence of it. Some people will ask me, well, what if your North Node is like, you know, what two degrees Aries? It, the draconic version then will be very similar, if not the same as mm. your tropical chart. The answer to that is that we're looking at higher expressions of the aspects. So when you're doing a normal delineation of, it, of a, say of a tropical chart, you'll be um, in a sense looking at the, the human qualities of the, of the, the sort of ordinary human qualities and experiences. Whereas the draconic takes it to the end of the spectrum and looks at the higher expression of that placement or aspect. So that in one sense, you get the almost pragmatic delineation and then you get the ideal delineation as to where you can go with these aspects. I mean, I've had quite a few clients who have a, an early Aries North Node. Mm. Um, and uh, usually they're people that from a very early age knew exactly what they wanted to do. They have a very uncluttered approach to life. So that the challenge lies within the tropical chart, believe it or not, because it's trying to use what you've got, but the higher expression of it. And in my book, I define what you mean by higher expression. What does Venus mean in the higher, in its highest form? What does Neptune mean? And, that, and by the way, I know some people listening will be traditional. They may not recognize the outers, that's fine. This draconic analysis does not depend on a modern approach necessarily. I mean, I'm happy to use dignities, for example. I will look to see if, for example, your Mars starts in, shall we say, Cancer, which is perhaps not the strongest place for Mars in the traditional perspective in the tropical system. And then in the draconic, it goes into Aries. That's a very strong indication of, in, of um, embracing cardinal energy. I recently had a client who had doubts about their ability to do something, but he had a very cardinal draconic chart and he, he only needed a bit of encouragement and now he's now doing the thing he said he could not do. That's interesting. It so, triggered something. So, uh, you know, the things can really change a lot for people. So, you, uh, um, can we look at the um, things can change a lot because you can go from being a very um, mutable person to being quite cardinal or go from being from quite cardinal to being fixed. And this is important, isn't it? The modality is really key. I, I, I noticed that in your book. They're absolutely key. You're absolutely right. Also, the elements. You may start off with a very fiery uh, chart and then it's very airy. Mm -hmm. chart. Um, if we could mute, Marion. Let me just see if I can mute. Okay. Um, so um, 
Now, the interesting thing to understand here is that we're not uh, saying that, let's suppose you start with a tropical cardinal chart and then it becomes very, um, uh, let's say it starts uh, very sort of mutable and then it becomes very cardinal. Um, that's not to say that we're dealing with an alternative. What we're saying is that you can go in that direction. It's part of a narrative. And it's the same with the elements as too. Um, you may have a very airy tropical chart and then it becomes very fiery. That's encouraging you to have greater faith in yourself, to listen to your hunches and to your dreams and your inspiration. A lot of people have to rationally, logically understand something before they do anything. They may have inner impulses, but seem to be afraid of trusting the inspirational, non-rational energies. So that, that's the important thing to understand. I've got a question here from someone. Yes. I think it's interesting, which is, um, she's saying this is still confused, but I think it is quite confusing initially with Draconic. Yes. Um, so she's just got her thing up on astro.com. That was quick. Um, so North Node is in Gemini, naturally, normally, and then the Draconic goes to zero Aries. Well, that's because it always does for everybody. Yes. Always yes. zero Aries. So that that that's what will happen. So there's no kind of surprise. Oh, it's zero Aries. That's where it's supposed to be. But the angles have changed. My ascendant, she says, is in Libra, but my draconic ascendant is in Leo. And I think that's a really interesting example. I mean, could you sort of speak to that a little bit? Obviously, you'd have to see the whole chart. Well, I've got to see the whole. I mean, in my, for example, I'll give you an example myself. I'm a, um, a tropical sun Gemini, but in the draconic system, I become a draconic Libra sun. Okay. Now, what does that actually mean? Um, I can't I can't answer the specific example, but if you take my example of the line of logic here, I don't cease to be a Gemini. I mean, you can't shut up a Gemini. But what's interesting about the draconic, <laughs> what the draconic chart is telling me is that I'll be a much more self-fulfilled Gemini if I can embrace the themes of Libra, which has to do with socializing, with understanding other people, being prepared to negotiate. But by the way, I've got an exact Saturn Venus opposition. Is that a clue? Um, so perhaps in earlier life that I had certain, I wouldn't say sociopathic tendencies, I don't want to defame myself, but let's say I had I struggled with the reality of other people, you know, and um, it's been quite a strong theme in my life about getting the best out of other people and out of relationship. I mean, I'm not single in my mid 60s for nothing. But I'm working. I mean, some people have some interesting theories about where I'm heading romantically, if not sexually, but we won't go there. It's not about me. <laughs> but if you understand that what I've done is not to say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Libra. No, what the chart is telling, the draconic chart is telling me is, look, you're still a Gemini, but try to embrace more of the Libra energy if you wish to actually realize things in your life, which has been the case, Christina. You know, and I can say from about my mid forties, things got a lot better because I had more friends. I, I consciously focused on trying to understand the people around me rather than constantly reacting to them. Mm, yeah. So I don't quite know how that answers the, the questioner's question, but yes, in most charts, the ascendant will change. Did you say that the person was a Gemini and had Libra rising? I said that um, her she just says her angles have changed. So she's gone from Libra rising to Leo rising, which I think is quite an interesting move. You know, well, that, that would tell you immediately without knowing the rest of the chart, but that's an immediate indication of embracing that which is your passion. Yeah. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean that you cease to be a Libra rising person. It just means that you're going to find greater fulfillment. And you could, you, some people will say, but you could say that to anybody. Well, not really. A lot of people do embrace their passions. They don't think twice. I mean, Le uh, you know, um, Leo is also to do with children, but it also to do with creativity. It has to do with management. It, it has to do with the spotlight. And really it's about surfacing your energies. And there probably are things in the tropical chart which indicate suppression of that, of that approach. There may be, parents or friends or people around you who suppress that side mm -hmm. you may find yourself in collectives or groups or organizations which inadvertently suppress your inner life 
So would you say that the draconic chart, the inner life, is really, that's what it's about? Yes. Is this, what is the draconic chart? It is a, about the inner life that is, and it's a route to evolution, to bringing that out. It shows you a kind of map, it maps that. Um, could you talk, um, okay. And I was just thinking, we haven't talked about this SOS chart of Elizabeth. The Queen of the queen, but I've just got another person here. Yeah, sure. Um, natal ascendant is Libra, sun is Scorpio. My draconic chart shows both become Leo. Um, yes, that's possible, actually. I suppose everything could move around. Um, yes, okay, so it's the same person. My natal sun is Scorpio. Okay, so this is, this is Vesta. So she's now, she, her ascendant moves from Libra to Leo and her son also moves from Scorpio to Leo. And that's interesting, isn't it? So she, she's, it's very much saying, get out there, girl, share yourself. Maybe share the, 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 the also the themes of Scorpio. Yeah. Um, which may have to do with all the things that we associate with. I mean, you, we have at some point as a client say, or as you're an observer of yourself, actually see whether the reality of your life can be described by what you're seeing. So Scorpio, for example, would tend to orient you to questing, to research, to the themes of Scorpio, so interest in death, that sort of thing, but also the mundane side of it too, mm. the sharing of value and things like that. So it's for the, the person observing their draconic chart or the client to actually see whether they can actually identify with themselves those themes that are being indicated by the signs and the planets. So to have such a strong Scorpio tropical chart by the sound of it, something within the self, maybe about dark themes or about themes of which are hidden, bring them out. Yeah, shine a light on it. Shine a light, which it, when you think about it is counterintuitive because we tend to want to stay in the shadow. <laughs> we think it's safer. Especially Scorpio. Can we talk about the Queen's, this Queen's double chart here? Because it's fascinating. It's very simple. Um, so what we've got here, the inner wheel is her tropical birth chart. The outer wheel is her draconic birth chart. What's interesting to me, if you go down into the fourth house, Neptune is now almost exactly, um, if not so, on her tropical sun. Mm. Uh, what I find interesting about that is that the very nature of her role in life it is is actually literally nebulous. It, it, if you think about it, it's very hard to define precisely what she does and why she does it. And why do we want that to happen? Why do we want it to, to, I mean, obviously this is contextual. If I didn't know it was the queen, I'd have to say that there are aspects of Neptune about this identity, which are hard to define. But yeah. that goes to the heart of her persona, of her, 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 her essence, if you like. There is something necessarily mysterious about the role that she plays. Now, in its negative manifestation, you might say that she's a fraudster, but plainly she's not. <laughs> or you might say that she has psychic abilities or she, she has super shrewd ability. I think she is super shrewd. Mm -hmm. I think one of, the thing, one of the reasons why she has been such a successful monarch is because she's been able to shape shift. Mm. And if you look at the synastry between, I've, I haven't got the chart up, but if you look at the synastry between Prince Philip and the Queen, it's quite interesting how his Uranus is the activator in her chart. And yeah. he definitely encouraged the shape shifting element that is, I think, central to her, her reign. And has said something really interesting here, which is yes. so true, which is, that her role require, requires a sacrifice of herself, which is completely Neptune. Excellent observation, a very, very good observation. And I would say, add another thing, which is that her role is about glamour. It's, it's glamour in the fairy sense. So there is Neptune, yeah, putting this cloak of glamour around her, um, a cloak of, of magic. And in fact, her role is a magical role She's performing a kind of magic for the nation, whether you like it or not, you know, that's yeah. really what's happening. Yeah. Um, and that's very Neptunian. So the Neptune on her son, just, I mean, you would might see that say in a film star, 
I think. Absolutely. Um, personnel, so I would expect to see that in. Absolutely, I totally agree. And that's marvelous uh, uh, interpretation. Interesting too, that the Draco MC is on um, um, Tropical Moon in Leo in the seventh house. I think that oh. too, I mean, the moon has connotations with the people, with the land, also with the family, themes of the family, but broadens in the seventh house. I mean, we, we don't lose sight of the fact that she has found it because the fourth house is so busy as well. But the sun, of course, disposits all that energy in the seventh house. So there's a direct relationship between the two. Yeah, yeah. And Anne has also pointed out that the Draco Neptune triggers sun Chiron. And yes. That her self-sacrifice is actually painful to her personal life. One might Absolutely, say. absolutely. Um, I think all that, it, and what I say about Draconic, yes, to some extent, we can see her purpose in the tropical to some extent. But when you put the sinister of self by all together, what you get is, is what I call the headline news. It's a phrase I use over and over again in the book. It's, it, it's staring you in the face, but it, it can be easily missed because maybe as modern astrologers, we're always constantly looking for complexity and abstruse ways of getting to the truth. And I'm not suggesting that's wrong, but I don't think we should be afraid of the headline news. And what I've found over hundreds and hundreds of analyses is how repeatedly the, the bywill states very clearly the nature of the sole purpose. Of course, astrology is not physics. It doesn't speak in concrete terms. What it does is to suggest a message or a flavor or an energy. Mm. It's interesting, for example, Draco Venus is on a uh, tropical Saturn. And here we have that merger of uh, the unified, albeit in Scorpio, but it's a unifying energy revolving around authority. And it's close to the MC as well. Well, also she's a queen. She's not a king, right? Well, there's that too. You know, the, whether, we, we, whether we can gender the planet pattern. these days, is it a self-identified female Venus? I mean, we have to ask that question. Yeah. But nonetheless, in context, you're absolutely right. Um, very interesting. Unfortunately for me, I, I, all my planets move into Capricorn, which I guess means I have to work all the time till the rest of my life. <laughs> if you want to become, and you are already, as a columnist on the Astrological Journal, the great authority, and there may be, and I'm just giving you an impromptu reading, there may be aspects to your nature and its tropical expression where you'd like to go running on the sea in your sandals. Yes. And throw everything to the wind. Yes. But draconically. I have to work all the time, like, like a Capricorn. In your shed. Exactly. Up a hill. <laughs> now, does anybody have any more questions about draconic? I know that was a really fast gamble through it. Um, I should, you know, I don't know if you have another example you want to show or anything more you want to say about this chart. Um, I don't really have it much to say. I, I only drew up the Queen's. Uh, we're going to talk about the Uranus North No conjunction shortly, where we look at the Queen's chart again. But uh, I'll give you another example. Um, if you think about Greta Thunberg, now we don't have a time of birth, so we don't know where everything is exactly in terms of houses. But you don't have to worry about that with draconic astrology because the, the nodes don't move that fast. So you don't need clock time birth clock time to actually do a draconic analysis. But when you look at her chart, interestingly, from memory, the uh, draconic Jupiter is exactly sitting on her Jupiter in Gemini. Wow. And of course, Jupiter, I always associate with guide, guru, higher knowledge. And over and over again, you find in people who seem to come into this life with a lot of information, you may not agree with what that person says, but they seem to have a very highly directed sense of purpose. And quite often, Jupiter will be very close to that north node. And in Gemini, the natural communicator. Mm. And of course, she's natural on Twitter. She's already had best-selling books. She, and although she's self-identified herself as being on the autistic spectrum, she's actually, by a kind of alchemy, turned it into a superpower. And that's the word she used. Mm. Mm, mm, good example. Because her Mercury is quite afflicted. I mean, if you look at the draconic part of her Mercury, it's quite afflicted, which suggests that she's had to struggle 
psychologically um, with various different problems in order to produce this hyper articulacy that she that she has. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very interesting. That's an example from the book, isn't it, as well as that? And that's in the book. Yeah, Hedy um, Lamarr is a good example. You know, she was the Hollywood actress who was both the glamour queen, one of those beautiful women in the world, supposedly by Hollywood standards, but also a scientist. Mm -hmm. And when you look at her chart, even in the tropical, it's, you know, she's got Neptune and Leo from memory. I think it's Moon and Neptune and Leo in the first, opposite Jupiter and Uranus in Aquarius. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things going on in the draconic chart too, but the, the, that extraordinary uh, dichotomy is amazing as an yeah. expression yeah. of that glamour and then the scientists. I, I have a question from Sabrina, actually, yeah. about draconic, uh, which is, she's got two questions. So it's a twofold question. Would a draconic chart be particularly important for people with a strong moon position or strong cancer in their natal charts? I think that is an interesting question. It's a very lunar people. Does their draconic chart become more important? No, I, I, I don't actually think that. Um, mm -hmm. After all, life purpose is not dependent on your sun sign or, your, or, or that sort of thing. Um, of course, it's, I always say to people, um, it's, for the, it's for each astrologer to make their own determination on these matters. I, I firmly believe that you, you learn your systems and then you make it your own. But I, I would tend to say, no, I don't think that a strong moon in itself means that a draconic interpretation is perhaps of more significance than if, say, for example, you've got a very strong Gemini chart or a Gemini moon or something like that. Um, there's another part to her question, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. She points out that the rulers of the Draco nodes are Venus and Mars. Does that how, does that influence your interpretation? How do you interpret Mars and Venus in the Draco chart? Is there? I mean, it depends on what's. It depends on the significance of the planets in the chart as a whole. I don't actually personally. Um, give them any more importance of being rulers of the draconic nodes uh, than any of the other planets, because I'm looking at other things, you see. I mm. don't microanalyze. For example, I'll give you an example. What if we're dealing with a bucket shape and Venus happens to be the handle? Then it's of great importance. But mm. what we're looking for are the, is the headline news. And what I try to encourage astrologers to do, and that's basically the central message of my book, is to familiarize yourself with another way of interpreting the chart, not to interpret it necessarily as you would the tropical, but you're trying to extract what, I, like for example, Neptune on the Queen's Sun. Yes, there's, you could say you're interpreting it in a tropical sense, but it actually has a very raised importance as a whole, because there's a lot else going on in this bywheel. But what the sun is doing is perhaps more important than anything else. Mm. 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 um now we've only got um we haven't got all night so i would like to move on unless anybody has any more draconic qu questions because i think really this is something i do recommend victor's book you know it is the best introduction to draconic astrology i can say that unequivocally because uh, it's very clearly written and easy to follow and kind of fun and interesting and it can add a kind of another dimension um I think you've said this several times this evening already, but I'll just repeat it. It's an addition to, to using the tropical chart. It is yes, not. It's a narrative. Think of a narrative arc or a story arc and try to get in. I mean, again, I'm only giving suggestions. I mean, you may study the subject and then reach a different conclusion. Um, I mean, uh, Pam Crane's book on the draconic chart is definitive. You know, it's, it has depth and it, it's wide ranging. But I did feel this subject needed a more practical introduction. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. hopefully that people can, I mean, my practice really took off um, once I employed Draconic, especially during the COVID thing. Yeah. And most of my charts are blind, by the way. Yeah, that's, in, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but I wanna move on now to talking about some other stuff um, because we thought, Victor, well, Victor pointed out that we've got this tremendous thing happening in, at the end of July, and the current astrology is pretty interesting, and we can sort of take questions about that as well, if anybody has any questions. But do you, 
Uh, oh, actually, before I move on from that completely, let's just address this, what you were saying about the draconic transit currently, because that does affect the Queen's chart. Yes. And it's interesting. It, it, what is it interesting? I mean, we don't know what it connotes, <laughs> but no. I think the observation is interesting that we're, we're doing this show on the eve of her cross zodiac uh, solar return uh, because the draconic sun is in its last stage of Aries, as I speak. Um, incidentally, if you want to know more about uh, draconic transits, there's this marvel. I don't know whether you can see it. Um, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, the Draconic Ephemeris. Yeah, the Draconic Ephemeris. It's by Ky Morgan C. Bender. You don't really need it because the computer will, the software program will tell you. But today is the last day of Sun in Aries um, for the next 11 months or so. And it will conjoin the Queen's Sun tomorrow in very early Taurus. I mean, she's virtually Aries, actually. It's only a few minutes into Taurus. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, 12 minutes in. Um, and... Um, I don't know what that connotes. I, I mean, I think that it uh, certainly determines a, um, a, an important new phase in her life, particularly given her age and particularly given other aspects that we can talk about. Yeah, I mean... I someone yeah. needs to mute. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. Uh, no, I think we're fine. Okay. Uh, we're definitely moving on to a new phase, aren't we, after that uh, tremendous eclipse in May on her Saturn? Yes, the, 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 the lunar eclipse in Scorpio was actually on her Saturn MC, certainly mm. on her Saturn. Mm. Um, I think it was around 24, 25 degrees Scorpio, something like that. Okay. And it was about that. I mean, we've been healing, hearing rumours about things behind the scenes about her health. Um, and I'm, I often think that we're not really told the whole truth about her condition. Um, no, but that to me was quite important. Yeah. And it was very clear that she was, she, she, I mean, she was interestingly absent from the Jubilee. You mm. know, she kind of turned up, but, and she turned up, speaking of that Sun Neptune conjunction, you know, across the, the two, across the draconic and the tropical charts. The most memorable thing about the whole Jubilee for me was her with Paddington Bear, which was completely <laughs> bizarre and, well, just completely bizarre and weird, but kind of charming. It's very charming and magical. It was, it was taking, she was literally in the magical land of, of, of a fictional character, you know, Absolutely. extraordinary. And actually that's where she really belongs in the minds of most of us, really. She's and also shrewdly, very gently taking the mickey out of herself, because there's always speculation about what's in the handbag and all that. Well, we now know marmalade sandwiches or whatever. Um, <laughs> but it was a wonderful touch. And again, it, it, it shows that, that despite having quite an earthy sort of chart, she is a shapeshifter. And that's more clear when you look at a draconic. Yeah, yeah. And, and also a, a, an actress. Oh, yes, most definitely. Most um, definitely. So do you want to talk about this conjunction at the end yes, of July? The, at the, towards the end of July, the uh, North Node, which, as we know, um, is retrograde. I mean, the, the true node it does go direct a little bit, but essentially it's going in the same direction as the mean node. And it's never different more than two degrees between mean and true. That's just a little abstruse point. But on the 27th of July begins the conjunction of the transiting North Node with transiting Uranus. Um, this does happen, you know, uh, periodically every 18 and a half years. But I think it has relevance this time because I looked at the, draconic, uh, the tropical chart and the draconic chart in the Queen's chart. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting that you can see down in the fourth house, which in itself is interesting, that the, you have this merger which will become exact at four minutes past 8 p.m. on the 31st of July. So this chart has been constructed for its exact moment, at four minutes past, uh, four minutes past 8 p.m. And unfortunately involves Mars in not its strongest sign. Mm. I mean, it's a sign of um, uh, Mars in its normal, you know, uh, taking it out of the sign it can involve uh, either violence or some kind of um, obduracy because it's in Taurus. Yeah. 
So the association, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I can also show you, I mean, that's going to affect us all in some way, shape or form. Unfortunately, if you look at the Russian Federation chart, mm. that particular conjunction sits on its on the Russia's MC. Yeah. So it's going to mean different things. But it's what's interesting that. is that this is taking place um, as we are approaching um, uh, the sun and moon conjunction. Mm. So that's interesting in itself. Um, but it's what the draconic chart, if I can show you the draconic chart. Yeah, go. Oh. So what I find interesting here is if you look at the third house, um, so what we've got here is um, we're looking at the draconic transit. So this is the tropical, this is the tropical uh, chart. But we're now looking at the draconic transits, which you can do. You can look at draconic to tropical, tropical to draconic, or draconic, draconic. If you're doing like a draconic solar return, it's all draconic. But in this instance, what we find is this interesting assemblage in the third house, quite close to the birth Uranus too. And what I find interesting is that both Mars and Uranus are in the very, very last moments of Pisces. Mm -hmm. about to go into Aries, which I always associate with either new life or a new phase. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to make any forecasts. I think it's inappropriate. I mean, it's interesting to look at Jupiter, Mars, exact conjunction, then the first, that's a very liberating sort mm -hmm. of aspect. So I'm wondering whether we're going to see a dramatic change in direction of the rain, such as a Regency, for example. Oh, yeah. I'm, it's I'm, a possibility. I'm pretty certain that this year is going to be a change. Um, you know, it's it's the end of her reign in some manner. Yes, uh, it's um, and also, I mean, it's interesting that the MC is sitting on fortune as well. Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's very. I mean, it's op opposing this energy as well. So, in a in its widest sense, I mean, just looking at the numbers, it, it's stretching a point slightly, but on the axis, it's quite relevant. Um, I'm just refamiliarizing myself with the charts. And it's interesting that Moon is on the, um, just going into the seventh house there. Just, it's emerging into the light, you know. Just thinking symbolically, mm. when we're comparing, we're using the Draco transits to the tropical chart. So yeah. that's your natal chart, having these Draco transits. How would you describe that as a, you know, that's your, you know, the tropical chart is yourself, is who you are. And the Draco transits are what are, how would you just, how would you put well, that in? The, the draconic transits are a feature of the, the nodal axis move. So that their very nature, the fact that we're talking about a different kind of zodiac, places them in um, a lunar, uh, a lunar chart in essence. Mm. So one's looking at the broadest themes and I think it's highly relevant in this particular chart that Mars and Uranus are in those last moments of Pisces. That's not very clear when, if you look at the tropical expressions. But when you look at the draconic, you're seeing something else. And it's almost nudging us towards a meaning. I mean, yeah. it remains to be seen whether it's true. But what I'm talking about is not something you've got to wait a year for. It mm -hmm. could be a number of days or weeks. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it is an experiment. I mean, I'm quite prepared to um, uh, say to people, you know, I think that we're looking at a very fundamental change in the rain. I mean, a lot of people are saying it and they're not astrologers. Well, mm. I'm looking at the draconic expression. Mm. So one's looking at the headline news again and the emotional, the emotional ramifications and things like that. Yeah. It's, it looks like, I mean, it's interestingly shocking, isn't it? But yes, Uranus yes. Is, is a shock or a surprise, and that's the odd bit about it to me. Yes, I mean, I, I'm trying, I, I would certainly resist trying to explore what that really means. No, but I would certainly there is a Uranian strong, and a, the, the proximity of Mars is also um, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that this particular. Um, conjunction coming up at the end of July, just for every, uh, Vesta has another question as well, but I just wanted to mention this conjunction at the end of July for everybody is it's going to be quite a huge thing, isn't it? Because it's Mars, 
Uranus and the North Node, all in Taurus, all gathered together. Um, and one doesn't want to sort of predict anything exactly, but this is a big sudden change. And it's got a very fiery side to it. It's in Taurus, which is an interesting, you know, it's a sign of, of money and value and worth. Yes. Um, and a dramatic change in the in the money and value worth of something. I don't know, perhaps. Okay. Um, so I think very interesting period to keep an eye on that last week of July to see what happens in the news. Yes, remember that the, the actual conjunction remains in orb for quite a few days, up to about yeah. 11th or 12th um, August. Yeah. Um, and we all know that astrology is not just about exactitude. No. Ooh, um, and sometimes it triggers things that are not apparent. Yes. You see. Um, that um, looks, it looks like an eruption or a, a sudden awakening of something at that point. Um, so, yes, I would say very significant moment this summer. Um, because, you know, we've had Uranus in Taurus for, well, since 2018, I think. Yeah, something like that. Um, and now the node is coming to it. Because, of course, as a draconic astrologer, you're a nodes guy. You like those nodes. You, I mean, there's something that you follow, aren't they? Yes, I follow them. And it, 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 bear in mind that um, although we say that draconic's been around since ancient times, we've got to understand that it's really only been developed in the 20th century. The system that I'm practicing at the moment was developed over decades in the 20th century. There isn't some source document in Babylon <laughs> dug up in papyrus form. And that's the basic objection to the system, that there isn't some ancient beard that we can locate it to. But there are plenty of systems in Hellenistic and in, in ancient astrology, and we don't know quite where they started. And that is with quite a few of these old systems, some murkiness about origin. And as I, I've said elsewhere, maybe the good thing to do is to actually use the astrology and see whether it works. Oh, yeah, you have to test it. I mean, the other thing about a lot of this ancient, the ancient stuff is that they... We're working at, at a time where there were no clocks and no computers. Yes. Well, they couldn't fiddle around with this stuff. I, you, you know, you can bet that uh, whatever Ptolemy or whoever would have been fiddling around with his computer if he had one, you know, and, you know I'm going to try this draconic thing. Um, That's why you have horary. I mean, horary is a feature of that. You don't yeah. have to worry about um, birth times if, you, if you're doing a horary. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, some of my best friends are horrors, things like that. Yeah. Obviously, with computers, and as you say yourself, you know, we can micro go to the nanosecond now, and we're not going to change this. Uh, you know, astrology has adapted to that reality. Mm -hmm. I've just got up the Russian Federation, by the way, and I don't like the look of it. Um, there are different there are different charts for Russia, but this one I find I use quite often. It's the 2022 one. And look at all that Taurus in the ninth house. Can you, That's okay, Russia okay, bedding okay. in. OK, let me just. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, I didn't realize that was the one. Oh my God. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. And it's, um, it, it tells me that Russia's definitely, it, you know, whatever, I mean, it's in the ninth house as well. It, it, it's become super obdurate and there is a violent aspect to it. It's highly eruptive. The involvement mm -hmm. of the of Uranus exactly on the MC is a great worry. I mean, from the perspective of, um, uh, the international scene mm. and as you said yourself I, I'd be looking at the cryptocurrencies I'll be looking at economies I'm wondering whether there's going to be another I mean I'm not normally given to um, forebodings uh, but certainly I'm, I'm looking at this conjunction with great interest and it's an experiment to see what happens exactly it's an experiment but it is a it's significant um, I'm just looking at what else is descendant yeah. on Pluto as well yeah and mercury is is squaring that you know it's, it's doing a little trigger thing with mercury it's squaring yeah. that setup yeah. Yeah. um and when you get mercury mercury may be the thing that makes it all flash you mm. know makes that when when mercury starts to make that connection which is what around the 27th of july yeah um, yeah and the other thing and it's the, the surprise element that Uranus brings and the irrationality, you know, some kind of irrational mm. 
um, explosion. Yeah, it's me not, not not my happiest, not, not my favorite configuration. Do you remember the last conversation we had about zombie charts when we were talking about Ukraine? And it was yeah. on Mars Pluto, wasn't it? Do you remember which way you looked at it with Lynn Bell? Yeah. Mars and Pluto were very significantly indicated. And in the Ukrainian chart, Pluto was in a part, I think, Pluto on the sun. Yeah. So it was extraordinary. Um, uh, mm. So in many ways, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are a number of different systems you can use. But uh, and I'm not, as I say, I'm not normally given to negativity, but I'm certainly a bit um, anxious. Yeah. I, I wouldn't book my flight for that day. Or even that it's two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I'm just suddenly worrying about one of my kids who's coming back here on the 3rd of August, thinking, hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, it's really related to economies and to, uh, but also states of mind. I mean, Taurus yeah. can be amazingly stubborn, but it's also to do with other things such as earnings, economies, things like that. So I'll be looking to see what's going on around that time. and. Uh, several days leading up to the several days um, moving away from the conjunction. It's also, you know, a great liberation, it could be. Could be that, that'd be the most positive way of looking at yeah. it. Yeah, it could be incredibly liberating. Yeah. Because I personally, I find that Uranus transits are often great, you know. The awakener, the awakener. I'm a Uranian person, so I like that, you know, I like, <laughs> the, I like the awakening, I like the electric shocks. I've, um, got, I've got progressed sun exactly on my Uranus in Leo at the moment. And how are you finding that? Well, certainly I've been more outspoken than normal. And some people say, what, how can you tell the difference? But <laughs> even better, I've got progressed new moon exactly on my Uranus in Leo in July. Okay, that's amazing. What are you going to do, Victor? <sighs> I don't know. I mean... I'm speechless, really, which is a first for me. I don't <laughs> want to think about it because, you know, it's in the sixth house. So some people have said, oh, we're going to have a heart attack. I said, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, great. But it, it could relate to the love life. It could relate to work, more likely work, you know. But it's a state of mind, I think. When you're dealing with progressions, it's, it's the overall existential condition rather than saying on that particular day, a certain mm -hmm. something the leading up to it has been much more independence in my mm -hmm. mind um certainly i've taken a more independent line in relation to the astrology world yeah not necessarily to the great satisfaction of one or two other people who shall remain nameless what's your um, um, sorry. Uh, what's this um what's your opinion um well I, no, I won't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what, what is it they don't like that you're doing that's so independent? But um, I, I just want to say that Liz, that uh, Anne has pointed out, that Liz Green once observed, if you think you can predict Uranus, it's not Uranus you are looking at. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, very good line. And it's true. It's true. But you know what? I can, you know, when I had my second child, I had Uranus on my son, I believe. Okay. And it was not a horrible shock. It was a fantastic birth, very high tech, but boom, out she came and she's been a joy ever since. You know, so a, a surprising person, moon in Aquarius, of course. Well, um, but you know, the, these, these Uranus, you know, it awakened me in a way that I hadn't been awakened before, you know, so these Uranus transits can be really good. I want to put that in because we've been a bit sort of like scary about that North node Uranus conjunction, but I, um, I do feel that one thing that's going to happen with that North node Uranus conjunction is that all, a lot of the stuff that we thought about Uranus going into Taurus mm is going to start becoming much more clear. So, you know, you're in a center Taurus. I thought there's going to be difference with, you know, money is going to change. You know, obviously we're going to go high tech with that, but also that we're going to be getting a lot more green technology. This is going to start coming online. It's going to become very, you know, there's a shift into the future that is going to happen with this conjunction. A practical shift into a practical new future is also possible. That's absolutely the case. And uh, it's a reminder to us all. I mean, 
if you talk about benefits and malefics, there's this tendency to get sort of very black and white about a horror yeah. story. But what you've just explained is absolutely correct. And that's why, as astrologers, it's probably a good idea to have a little humility and say, look, yeah. this is a starting point for a number of possibilities. Yeah, exactly. You just outlined the most positive, map, which probably is also true, but there may be sort of subdivisions to the themes, you see. Yeah. So, but I'm certainly looking for a major change of something because of Mars as well. But I think that's a, an extra yeah. power there. It, it's, it's not it's going to Mars be just something we don't notice. Yeah, and it's the Mars that I think makes it a little bit worrying rather than the Uranus, if, it, if truth mm -hmm. be told, is that Mars coming in at that moment is, you know, one, one of the things that Uranus does is it turns things upside down. Yes. So something. So what's going to happen with this? I think is something. Some values are going to be turned upside down. Whether that's the literal, um, you know, financial value of something, or people's values being turned upside down. Um, things that you know, there's a huge, there's a shift there that happens almost very quickly. I mean, that the combination also of, of, of Mars coming in there adds speed to this whole thing. I'll be looking at cryptocurrency. I mean, we've had a, quite a big collapse this year. It'd be interesting to see yeah. what happens there as well. In, in fact, one's looking at a diff number of different fronts. I mean, the chart we're looking at the moment is specific to Russia. Yeah. But we could we could put up a million different charts. We don't have time for that. Yeah. And we will see different themes, different areas that possibly may be in an upturned state. Mm. You know, and of course, you've got Neptune close to that south node, which is also quite interesting. Mm. um but we won't go there <laughs> yeah yeah uh, oh apparently cryptocurrency crashed again today so it's crashed oh, really? the place okay. um i you know i haven't been i haven't kept it's lost a huge amount hasn't it in the last year but i mean one thing that we can be certain of with uranus and taurus is that we're going to you know that is possibly the end of cash money you know that we're already all of our money is already electronic. But as someone in one of these forums pointed out, I think she don't know if she's here tonight with Seema, you know, we're already electronic anyway. Do you know, it's not that we all have to move to cryptocurrency. We've already done it because we, you know, for people, what happened during the pandemic was, you know, cash almost hasn't disappeared completely, but it's really, the use of cash has really gone down. Well, I think COVID, the lockdown has certainly accelerated that process. It's an evolution. I mean, we, yeah. as astrologers, we sometimes tend to think, oh, well, on the 3rd of June, yeah. it's going to change. It, it's not like that. Um, the closest to something like that was actually the development of the COVID-19 um, yeah. pandemic, when it seemed to be an overnight thing. And Uranus in the draconic chart was bang, in the middle of all that Capricorn energy. You don't see it in the tropical chart. I mean, the Uranus relationship to the Capricorn planets all bunched together doesn't really mm. explain what happened. But when you look at the draconic for that moment, when we understood that there was a pandemic, where was Uranus, but bang in the middle of all that Capricorn energy? Really? So it's the awakener, it's the awakener. I mean, I'm not trying to say there's a moral purpose to a pandemic, but the fact mm. is, we had the pandemic, and we can learn a great deal from it. But I think there was a moral element to it too. Yes, I mean, I think there was an. I would, yeah, moral, spiritual. There definitely was some kind of. If you were awake, which is Uranus. If you were awake or woke, which is a word we're not allowed to use anymore. I, I'm happy with being woke. <laughs> or woke to it, you notice that the pandemic was doing something spiritually i just want to say what um yeah vesta's woke and proud too me too vesta that's two of us um but and saying her that her moon's nodes research and do you want to just turn yourself on and say this you unmute yourself or shall i get rid of the charts uh, yeah if you like let's do that then we can uh, see anne in her glory yeah do you want to unmute yourself Oh, I'll unmute you. Let me just see if I can ask to unmute. Oh, I can't. We can't hear you. I can now uh, ask to unmute. Okay, oh, you can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did. I did a, a. I think both of you know about the research study I did called the Moon's Nodes in Action a number of years ago, 
And what came through very strongly was when, when the transiting nodes are linking with any of the outer planets or a combination of them, then it does really bring powerful feet feeling changes in the wider world. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I know that when the Arab Spring broke out, the, I think the nodes were linking in with Pluto in, in some kind of a way. There was a lot of stuff involving the nodes and the outer planets then anyway. And we know the world-changing events that unfold from that. So mm. I think this will be exceptionally interesting. Maybe some major tech breakthrough heralding the new world order emerging, because undoubtedly we are moving into a new world order. The Jupiter-Saturn conjunction at zero Aquarius on the winter solstice of 2020 was the beginning of 200 years of these conjunctions going through the air element, having passed from a previous 200 years in the earth element, which roughly spanned the era of industrialization and the exploitation of our planet for resources with the consequences that we've seen. And then as soon as we moved into air, we had an airborne pandemic that turned the world upside down and we had everyone going into air. Here we are on air. Um, I'm teaching across the world in air. We all are doing stuff on air that we would never have thought possible. So it does, so the, and Pluto is moving into Aquarius next year, beginning and then settling into Aquarius in um, 2024. And then we have Neptune moving into Aries into 2026. So there's a big shift mm. of earth and water into air and fire so we are moving into a new era so looking at it from that context okay there, there's all kinds of doomy things we could think about that mars uranus nodes link up and i mean i've got it squaring all my personal planets so if i disappear it's been nice knowing you all but i'm choosing <laughs> i can't not, imagine that <laughs> i'm choosing not to go down that road but you know maybe there will be some difficult stuff we can't tell because uranus is notoriously left field but it looks to me as though, plugging into something you said, Christina, there is a feeling of, there's all kinds of tech stuff going on behind the scenes that's quite amazing, that's being pushed by this shift into new energy, and maybe something will appear at that point. Mm. I don't know, it's a thought. Mm. But I always fall back on what Liz said, which is, if you think you can predict Uranus, it's not Uranus you're looking at. Mm. I think, I mean, I do think of Uranus as like a big... These are my thoughts for what it's worth. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, it's worth, it's worth, I don't know, what is it worth? A lot. It's okay, very well, valuable. Shall I now shut up? Oh, I'm, no. a very, I'm a very well-behaved six planets in Leo person. I will now shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Who's actually that? draconic Gemini. Oh, is she? Well, she, all that... All that Leo goes into Gemini in her 10th house. Yeah, he's put me into Gemini. I'll never forgive him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I saw your chart. Anne's chart is in the book as well. Yeah. Um, Teacher, yeah. Communicator, writer. Yeah, I think it's... Blah, blah, blah. I actually thought that was kind of extraordinary because uh, knowing Anne well, I, that particular chart. Um, yes, um, Vesta's just pointed out that the EU just made a law about universal chargers for phones. Could that be an example? I think it Part could be it. an example. I, d I do. I mean, that may seem small, but actually it's incredibly stupid that we all have different, you know, electrical fittings. Why is this not universalized? It's and not practical. And one of the things about Taurus as a sign is that it's an extremely practical sign. Um, so we have the technology, we need to be using it. And we already are. And there's also this sort of rippling effect, you know, when there's something new emerging into the collective that's quite big, then you're mm -hmm. going to get things like um, what you just said, Vesta, oh. and various indicators until there's something big comes right through. So it'll be it'll be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder also, I was thinking, I went to the petrol station today and filled up my car and nearly died. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and I just thought, this is unsustainable. This is just not even sustainable. I mean, financially for people, but it's just not, this is going to change. This oil crisis is going to change cars and car driving if it carries on for much longer. Not much longer, not that much longer. Six weeks to the 27th of July. You know, I was, I spent more than a hundred pounds. Wow, that's amazing. 
Yeah. Well, maybe the, his emperor, the, the, his majesty, the, the Elon Musk has all the answers. Oh, no. Part lately, but um, who knows? I, I, I don't like Elon Musk. He gives me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say that between friends. Um, and we're not public, of course. Oh, yeah, except I am about to publish this. On. I'll just edit that, but uh, say I really like Elon Musk now. Um, we'll put a speech bubble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I haven't looked at his chart in a while, but he does. Um, interesting, he said something I actually agreed with recently. Yeah, like he would like to know how many fake accounts there are on Twitter. Yeah, so would I, actually. But that seems to be a little feature of the moment. Prince Charles saying that this Rwanda thing is appalling. He's just speaking, <laughs> speaking the truth. Um, do we have anything else we want to talk about? We've talked, you've talked very eloquently. Thank you. Uh, ooh, Saturn is on his Mars in Aquarius, on Musk's Mars in Aquarius. That's interesting. Mm. Well, not necessarily a great thing, actually, but still. No, no, it's not, is it? It's um, quite, it can be quite. Then he is quiet. having problems, isn't he? Is he? Will he really take over Twitter? There seems to be a rearguard action against it. Yeah. Um, you know. $44 billion, is that the price? Something like that. I've not looked at the chart though. Mm. No, I'm just waiting for, for it to sort of uh, happen, you know? Mm. Um, and you uh, so we'll wish Her Majesty a, 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 a tropical draconic happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. It, this group here, probably the only people in the world that know this. So it'd be interesting to see what happens tomorrow. Yeah, I like what Sabrina said about Elon Musk. Sorry, I'm just reading the thing down here. Reality check on Musk's plans to move to Mars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I hope so. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard anyway. Oh, we're all <laughs> going to just move to Mars. So, you know, who cares what happens on Earth? Right. Okay, good plan, Elon. Mm -hmm. um, okay, look, it's been a pleasure hosting you here. Uh, hold up the book. Exactly. Hold up the book. It is a good introduction, and um, it's quite short, and it's got Anne Whitaker's chart in there. Yeah, if you want to know more all about Anne. And um, yeah. No, no. What really, what's more important is that this is a really good. I've reviewed this book, um, and it really is very good. It's it gives a very clear introduction to a really basically quite a complex subject. You've done it really well, Victor. Thank yeah. you, Anne, and, and thank you, Christine. It's been a great pleasure. To be invited on your fabulous show it should be on bbc one really <laughs> i know um, what are they but, thinking <laughs> you know you can't have everything but uh it's been a great pleasure christina and thank you yeah it's a, a pleasure having you thank you and thank everybody uh thank you everyone for coming bye i'm gonna bye. end it there.